Hello, hello. I don't know if it matters to anybody, but I'm back after being off for a while. I had unused vacation time that I, I had to use up. And apparently, if you don't do that, they give it to somebody else. Um, it could be anybody, too. So I, I didn't think that, that didn't seem right somehow. Um, so anyway, I'm back. And I, you know, I so far I haven't banged my head against the microphone. I'm, I'm acclimating is what I'm saying. All right, so today's show which was brought to us by the very talented producer Lily Tyson, who's going to be doing some work for us this summer as we recover from the departure of senior producer Bootsy Kaplan. Lily brought us this idea of the way people use Zillow these days um, and, and related things, but Zillow in particular, I think. Zillow kind of rules them all. And, and they do it, people use it, yeah, they use it to advertise their houses for sale or to find houses they might want to buy. But people use it also aspirationally. People dream on Zillow. And in fact, a, a team at Surety First interviewed more than 1,000 Americans uh, about this. Uh, they discovered that 55% of respondents admit to spending between one and to four hours a day on the site. 33% surveyed received three to five Zillow alerts per day. 58% of respondents have missed an important deadline because they were browsing Zillow. 63% have looked up the friends, the value of a friend's house. 53% value of their boss's house. 56% have canceled plans with a friend to browse Zillow instead. And 62% of respondents browse houses that are at least $100,000 more than their current home. I think that sort of speaks to the aspirational notion of Zillow. But also a lot of this was probably triggered by the pandemic. People are living, you know, spending more time in their houses, realizing some of the drawbacks of their houses. And we can talk about those as we go along. But before we even get to the guest, uh, let me just point out that this was so obviously a trend that Saturday Night Live suggested that Zillow was kind of Zillow fantasizing was maybe the new sexual fantasizing. Are you bored? Mm -hmm. Looking for something to spice up your life? Oh, yeah. You used to want sex, but you're in your late 30s now. And sex isn't really doing it for me anymore. You need something new. Something exciting. I need a new fantasy. Then you need... Zilla. 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 is your sex now and our listings are just standing by waiting for you to browse them. an updated colonial with mature landscaping unleash your passions i want to flip that satisfy your every fantasy mm, i'd never live in north carolina but if i did i could buy a big gross mansion <laughs> So what are you waiting for? Pick up your phone now. Open the app and tell us what you really want. And if you don't know what you really want, th that's where our first guest, Ariel Norling, comes in. Uh, she is the author of I Know a Spot newsletter. I Know a Spot, uh, which collects interesting online real estate listings. Uh, it's uh, every bit as addictive as uh, Zillow. Uh, in its more raw, unfiltered state, but it's much more efficient because Ariel does a lot of your legwork for you, finds really interesting things to uh, for you to look at. So, Ariel Norling, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So this all does have something to do with the confinement associated with the pandemic, right? There's some way in which, I mean, not to say that Zillow surfing wasn't going on before or that people weren't using it in a, maybe in, in a fairly novel way, but there's something about you're stuck in your house, you realize you don't have as many doors that you could close off as maybe you <laughs> wish you did, stuff like that, right? Absolutely. I mean, I know that I was a big Zillow surfer when I was in grad school before this, but uh, my Zillow surfing went way up once the pandemic started. And I recognize that as a trend with all of my friends too. And that's essentially how the newsletter got started was sending Zillow links back and forth to one another, or tweeting about them. Right. And we'll, as we go along here, we'll talk about the fact that some of these links are just genuinely entertaining because the houses are really unusual looking. I mean, you really find some amazing looking places. Uh, some of the houses are really bizarre and a few of them can be frightening. Uh, but before we even get to that, I, I don't know, when you're doing it, when you're looking at these places, uh, you know, reading your newsletter, I, I sense at least that some of the time – you're doing what most of us do, which is you project yourself into that house. Okay, maybe I don't have $2.4 million to buy that place, but if I did, here's how I'd live? 
Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I feel like the better my writing becomes, it's generally a reflection of how much I want to escape from my current condition. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time projecting myself into these amazing houses. Right. And and I think that word escape is really important, too. We've all been through, you know, more than a year of a situation that was difficult to escape and, yes, a confinement that was difficult to escape. So that's another thing. Yes, you haven't left the state of Connecticut or wherever you live for many, many, many months, but you could look at a, at a you know, kind of Pueblo revival house in New Mexico with the view of the mountains and just suddenly, suddenly you're escaping maybe at that level. Yeah, it's like a free vacation you can take in your mind. But it's more than a vacation, right? Because one of the things that we're thinking about is like a vacation is a place that we go and we come back. And and I, obviously that's essentially what we do when we, we use Zillow that way. But we're also really thinking of life, right? Life, home is where you live. Home is where you spend years and years of your life typically. So it's it's a little bit of that somehow, I would think. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, especially in American culture, kind of the predominant idea that our our identities are shaped by where we live and especially the things we consume and the places that we live and that you could just reinvent your life if you move somewhere else and become this new person is a really predominant narrative. And I know that I've absolutely bought into that. Um, I think it's really easy to think well, I would just live a much better life if I lived in New Mexico and wasn't stuck in my small apartment with three roommates in an urban center. Um, and, and, you know, I think also the, the level of aspiration probably depends on what rung of the ladder you're starting on. I assume there are some people looking at Zillow who don't own a house and aren't even really sure they'll ever own a house. And then there are other people who own a $250,000 house and are are, you know, fantasizing about owning a $750,000 house. Yeah. And I think part of it is ownership in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're, we're always kind of thinking about, you know, what, what would that next rung up for me be? And it's not renting a fantastic apartment. There's something to the ownership level there. I'm not sure that the price tag necessarily is the only thing it's, it can be features too. Like my life would be so much better if I had a swimming pool or a sauna. I think how I relaxed I would be. Um, but it's the price is certainly a part of that because if you could afford those things that would magically transform your life already, you probably would have purchased them, right? Right. So speaking of swimming pools, let's maybe talk a little bit about the house that I, I think started all this or kicked you into this uh, particular kind of space that you're in right now. It's one in your neighborhood uh, where an architect did something kind of unusual with a swimming pool. <laughs> yes. So uh, this is actually the only house that my partner and I have ever fundamentally disagreed on. Um, otherwise, I think we're pretty aligned about uh, houses that we love. Um, and I like weird houses, so that says something. But just a couple of blocks away from us, there's this house that was, I think, kind of a regular traditional 1940s suburban house. And an architect bought it and moved in and added this ultra modern addition to the back where they essentially enclosed the backyard, including the swimming pool and a giant pine tree um, into this cantilevered deck. And now they have cedar siding on the sides and floor to ceiling windows and this huge open living space. And they have a sunken living room and what used to be the swimming pool. And I just couldn't stop thinking about this house. Um, even after living in my current house for two years, I just kept thinking about this house and uh, I eventually tweeted about it and it went uh, somewhat viral. And that's how I started getting peer pressure from my friends to start this newsletter. And let's be honest, you're still thinking about that house. Oh, totally. At, from that tweet, I actually found out that a friend of a friend bought that house. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as it's safe, I plan on knocking on their door and asking if I can come visit. <laughs> you're a house stalker. Um, I mean, I don't look at people's property values on Zillow or, or do the 3D house tours the way that I know a lot of people do, but I certainly jot down interesting properties all the time and check them out later. Right. And, you know, another thing, I don't know how, whether this came naturally to you or, I mean, whether you already kind of had this in you or not. I, I personally don't know much uh, about architecture in general, and I certainly don't know much about residential architecture in general. So, um 
you know, one thing about your newsletter, it's kind of an education in kind of fancy architects who design fancy houses. Uh, and this seems to be something that you've really gotten interested in. I don't know if you were already aware of all that, like if you knew who Ed Niles was already. Uh, no, not at all. Um, I did want to be an architect growing up, but I quickly abandoned that dream and kind of never really investigated it. And I found myself being quickly pulled into that world, being really fascinated, wanting to know more about architectural features and eras and styles and architects. And I think especially for some of the lesser known architects, some of them have really fascinating stories. And so I feel like every week I'm buying new books or watching new documentaries, <laughs> uh, just kind of immersing myself as much as possible as I can, partly because I think it helps make the fantasy even more alive to me. I think if you can feel the spirit of the architect and kind of have a sense of their personality, it makes it even more interesting and fun and aspirational. We should say that Ed Niles, who I went on, I did this, you made me do the same thing, Ariel. Uh, I never heard of Ed Niles before, and then I went on, you know, looking at all these things and reading about him. So he's this guy who does, it's hard to explain, that there are these not just modernist, but really futuristic homes that often either look like parts of an alien spacecraft or or like some kind of kitchen implement that we got turned into a house. There's a thing called the salad spinner house, right? Maybe you want to say a little bit more about him. Yeah, I think you did a pretty good job of uh, summarizing his work, but I it's not like any house that you've ever seen before. I think calling it a house uh, makes it seem more normal than it really is, but I think his work is incredibly polarizing. I happen to love it, not necessarily the salad spinner house, um, mm. but I, I just really love when people push the boundaries, and I don't think anyone pushes those boundaries harder than Ed Niles. And, and as you suggested earlier, too, uh, um, there are these stories behind them. In fact, I, I think it might be your latest uh, edition of the newsletter. You kind of discovered the story of this uh, kind of sad story of this uh, architect, Norman Jaffe, who did these kind of remarkable bits of architecture, or domestic architecture, mostly around Long Island, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and in the Hamptons. And and you should explain, I mean, he ultimately disappeared um, after going swimming? He did. Uh, that was a very interesting story to me because it was this person who had been known for being incredibly aspirational. He he wanted to prove himself among the big New York architects, but it was hard to get taken seriously when he was doing homes for rich people in the Hamptons. And so he was at this point in his life and his career where he had raised his son. He just completed this huge skyscraper project in New York. And it was like, all right, I've arrived. I've done the thing that I really want to do in my career. And then he went out for a swim um, off of Lang Island one morning and never came back. And no one really knows what happened to him. His body didn't show up. They found a hip bone that was proclaimed to be his, but nobody knows for sure. They didn't DNA test it. And there's been some speculation that maybe Norman Jaffe just kind of abandoned his life, went to South America and has been living it up. Um, and I think that also adds to the mystery and allure of his houses because um, we know that he was getting into uh, spirituality um, and his kind of Eastern and Jewish influences were were starting to really impact the way that he was thinking about his life and his work. And so some of the, the best work he's ever done is um, a synagogue in the Hamptons. Um, and I, I just kind of love that, that there's a, that air of mystery uh, and spirituality in this house that contributes to that story. Right. Although it's sort of interesting when people have kind of a conspiracy theory or a, uh, some kind of obscure notion of, about what happened, uh, they seize on details that aren't actually meaningful. Like one of the details is he left his wallet on the front seat of his car. Well, he's going swimming. I mean, he's not going to take his wallet with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway. If I was running away, I would grab my wallet for sure. Yeah, except no, you, if you're going to change your identity, maybe you do want to lose the wallet, but who knows? Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, we should also say that due to your own life circumstances, you have, and, and, and it's not confined to you, and in fact, we have a number of people who are employed here who probably feel similarly. You have a certain thing about Pittsburgh um, and, <laughs> and houses in Pittsburgh. Tell us about Pittsburgh. So I went to grad school in Pittsburgh mm. and I spent a couple of years living there and just really fell in love with the city. And um, I will say I am biased because my mom essentially raised me to be in love with Pittsburgh. 
Uh, I grew up on a very steady diet of, uh, of Steelers games and of flash dance and, and all kinds of Pittsburgh references. And my family used to take trips there growing up. So I knew that Pittsburgh was a special place. And then I think there's also something to the variety of architecture there, the different kinds of people there. It feels very different from where I currently live, which is Oakland. Um, and I think another part of it is the affordability of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of this up and coming energy, but things are still really affordable. And so for me, the affordability and coming back to this place I really love um, is a big part of the dream. Yeah, although I have to say, Bay Area money, you know, I mean, unless you're like looking to, you know, move to Hong Kong, uh, Bay Area money will get you a lot. I have friends, I, I took them, or they live in, in San Francisco, uh, and I took them on a tour of New Haven, which has some really beautiful houses. And this is before the pandemic. Uh, and they just had their phones with them, and they were just kind of zillowing everything we walked by. <laughs> and they were just making these kind of orgasmic noises at a certain point because just, you know, the, whatever you're paying for a property in the Bay Area it will buy you a lot. Uh, in a lot of places. I guess that's why uh, Daniel Levy says that thing in the Saturday Night Live thing. I could, in North Carolina, I could have a gross mansion. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, But you can buy really lovely houses in Connecticut for North Carolina money sometimes. You can also buy really expensive ones from really famous architects. And I think that variety is also what makes Connecticut really interesting from an architecture and real estate perspective. Oh, right. And we should actually mention one of your favorite houses recently is this it's really strange looking at this triangular house. It's a right triangle, I think. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's sitting on what looks like kind of an outcropping or something. Tell us about the triangle house in Guilford, or have I already described it? <laughs> That's a pretty good description. The only thing I would add to it is that um, it kind of looks like a sailboat. Mm -hmm. It was designed to be this retreat um not for vacation in particular, but just kind of being alone with one's thoughts and looking out on the sea. And you definitely feel like you are sitting in a boat looking out at the sea when you're in this house. Um, and I just think it's incredible. It's definitely one of my favorite houses of all time. So our technical producer, Cat Pastor, wants to warn you that um, if you have a sunken living room, people will think you're a swinger. Uh, and that <laughs> that may or may not be true, uh, and Kat may or may not be revealing things about her own experiences, uh, but I think it is true that when we look at these houses, when you, when we're if you're going to Zillow for two or three hours and you're going to project yourself into these houses, I think that you know you kind of have two choices, right, Ariel? You can either take your life with you and go, oh yeah, my dog would run in that yard, or oh, I would cook this way I cook in that kitchen, except I'd have more room to make risotto or whatever. Or you can start thinking of yourself living this different life there. I mean, I, I think for some people anyway, that's probably part of, of the fantasy. Not that I would just go and be my own boring self in this house, but I would be a much cooler person making different choices. Absolutely. If I wanted to be the same old me, I would buy probably like a regular suburban house. <laughs> but I think there's something to looking at these houses that are incredibly amazing and aspirational that make you want to have that reset. You want to be that person who lives up to that house. Yeah, that, I think that's true. And there's also that sense, because in fact, we're often looking in different locales. Like if it weren't for you, I probably wouldn't have looked at so many New Mexico houses. But, you know, then you're sort of thinking, yeah, so I would be this kind of cool high desert person, you know, and I would... I would do all this other stuff, too. I mean, be, because, in fact, we live where we live. So you live in Oakland, you do Oakland stuff, you know. Uh, but, but if you lived in Sedona, you'd have this more kind of high desert life. There's, there's a way in which, because we're allowed on Zillow to make ourselves live anywhere, you really can start to sort of think not only about what you do in the house, but what the rest of your life would be. Absolutely. It does make me feel a little bit like Sylvia Plath, though. You know, you're just kind of <laughs> overwhelmed with all of these options and you can see all these different lives ahead of you. And I would feel so much anxiety if I wasn't a homeowner already about which life and location to choose. 
uh, hopefully you're the first person ever to connect Sylvia Plath to Zillow. Uh, and it's probably, <laughs> probably not a, con- uh, a connection that they would entirely relish. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a break uh, here. We're going to talk a little bit more about this with Ariel afterwards. We're going to add to the picture uh, a, a realtor who can talk a little bit about the difference between Zillow and real real estate life. Um, and towards the end, we're going to talk about what happens when you're trying to sell a house that's haunted. Side, little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they came out all the same. We're back. Uh, we're talking to Ariel Norling. She's the uh, creator of I Know a Spot, a newsletter which connects, collects interesting online real estate listings, uh, usually on places like Zillow. Uh, and in just a second, we're going to add uh, Dana Bull, a realtor with Sagan Herberside Sotheby's International Realty, based in Massachusetts, and a former columnist for the Zillow Group. Um, actually, why don't we add Dana right now, too, so both of you can talk about this. Uh, first of all, Dana Bull, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to have both of you comment on this a little bit, but uh, Ariel, I'll start with you. Most of your newsletters, um, most of the houses that you feature in your newsletters, you're kind of appreciative of what they are, you know, and I mean, they might be a little odd, odd or, but they're special in, in a way that would probably be attractive to somebody. We should probably acknowledge that there is a whole other subgenre and it's epitomized in accounts like Zillow Gone Wild and stuff like that of houses that are really kind of galactically horrible or have genuinely frightening or upsetting features, right? I mean, that's like a whole other thing that people wind up kind of vibing off of. Uh, correct, Ariel? Absolutely. And I get sent those listings all the time. And and I, I don't know. I mean, for example, there's one, I saw one, I mean, it really had kind of a straight up dungeon in the bottom, you know, and not like even a nice dungeon with somebody like with the, you know, 30 shades of gray kind of, you know, uh, high end <laughs> PTS and M going on. It was like a nasty d- dungeon. And I'm thinking, who? I mean, if somebody bought this house, you'd immediately be very suspicious of them, right? <laughs> uh, I would probably try to spin it more positively and just say they're eccentric and adventurous. But I can absolutely see why you would think that. And Dana Bull, as a realtor and as somebody who was a former columnist for Zillow, you got to be aware of this too, right? There's like this whole area of stuff that's up on Zillow where you simply cannot imagine or don't want to imagine what has gone on in this house. Oh, sure. And I've learned working in real estate that you never know what's behind closed closed doors. Things could seem perfectly normal um, just looking at the exterior of a home (laughs) and then you get inside and it's a completely different story. So, um, Dana, I want to talk a little bit about sort of because, in fact, Zillow has become such a powerful medium for people to look at houses and, and, and show their houses. Uh, I want to ask both of you, but Dana, I'll start with you. What, what makes a successful Zillow presentation? So, hands down, it's all about the photography. That's the first thing that captures prospective buyers, uh, making sure that that photography is high quality and the theme of the day seems to be aspirational. And that's that's what hooks people is they want to envision their life in a home and they're um, just quickly scanning on the internet and they need the, the photos to grab them. And Zillow has kind of changed over the years and now those the photos are front and center, the description, you have to scroll down. Um, so it's, it's really about the photography. Um, Videos have become more important this year during COVID, but and and that's important, but definitely secondary secondary to the photography. Yeah, there's sort of Dina, you know, a, a version of curb appeal that is now the sort of the header photograph. The first picture you see uh, of that house is is going to you know have a disproportionate impact on people. Exactly, and people. The idea is that you you want to grab their attention and then they've been thinking about it. And if it's prompted them to actually request a showing by the time they arrive at the home, they've already been dreaming about what their life looks like living in that home. Um, So there's just this component to it where people like to imagine 
what their future looks like, what the chapter, their next chapter looks like. And it all starts with that photography. Ariel, this, it's going to be especially important, particularly if you want to attract Ariel Norling enough to have your house appear in I Know a Spot. But you must really notice the difference between good and bad photography. Absolutely. I think I'm able to look past bad photography, but I will say it makes a big difference in in how I even feel when I'm trying to think about how to present a house. It can be incredibly challenging if you feel like they don't showcase the house in the best light possible. And the photography is a huge part of that. Absolutely the most important thing. Um, I would say the only other things that come close to helping kind of instill the vibe that people are trying to aspire to um, the videos are, are like 3D walkthroughs and then a description where people can see themselves in it. But the photography being bad is almost certainly a killer for that listing. Which, you know, Dana, actually, I think heightens um, a problem that, and I should confess here that, I don't know, it's not a confession. <laughs> I should say here that my father, my, who's long, long, long passed away, but was for many years a real estate agent. And he was driven nuts by curb appeal. Uh, he basically, when, when he walked into a house, the first thing he did was go to, I mean, as long as he wasn't like a dinner guest there or something, he would go down to the basement because he thought all the secrets of the house were in the basement. Uh, and and he was also, I should say, this may have made him a less successful real estate agent, but I talked to people to whom he had shown houses. They were looking for houses. And, and one woman told me that as they pulled up towards the curb of a house, and she would look out the window and go, no. And he would simply accelerate away from the curb. <laughs> he wouldn't even try to bring her in and talk her into it. But, Dina, it is sort of true that people probably put a disproportionate uh, amount of weight uh, on the first thing they see uh, when, when they see a house. Yeah, and I think that we're all sort of victim to that. Even myself, I have a trained eye. I can look past bad photography and always want to be open-minded, even if the exterior isn't, um, you know, hitting all the marks, I, I still recommend to my clients that we should go and look at homes because the situation we're in right now is historically low inventory. So, um, you know, in the past, you would be able to just canvas a market and have all these options to choose from. And right now, people really need to be creative, be strategic, and you can't really rule things out off the bat right now because there's just so few options. Learn learn to love. Um, yeah. <laughs> learn to love. So, um, you know, Ariel, reading your newsletter, this happened to me in particular, and I, I don't know that it exactly happens to me looking at Zillow, but lo- reading your new- <laughs> newsletter, and I'm wondering if it happens to you too, I guess, is, so I'll look at your newsletter and there's like, you know, a, a $4.2 million house and there's a $2.5 million house. I think one time there was like a $75 million house. <laughs> but, um, you know, and then I'll get to like an $888,000 house. And I'll go, oh, there's one I could afford, which is not true. I cannot afford <laughs> an eight hundred eighty. But there's sort of interesting, you know, as you do that aspirationally, you, you start changing or, or tricking yourself into thinking that you can have more than you really can have. Yeah, absolutely. I think it it really hurts because then when you start looking at houses that are actually in your budget, uh, what you can afford doesn't always live up to those aspirations. So it's definitely a learn to love situation. Yeah. And and Dana, maybe you could say a little bit more about this too. I I think I'm wondering um, if the existence of Zillow and Trulia and other stuff like that, but the existence of Zillow I don't know. I think maybe we're all starting to think we're experts about this somehow, you know, because we can look at a, we can, we can look we can do 3D tours or whatever. We can look at 50 houses in three or four hours. And I'm wondering if maybe the buyers or potential buyers are starting to think that either they know more than they really know or that they can afford more than they can really afford just because of this weird, unrealistic, dreamy state we get into. So I would say initially, yes. I think what What's changed over the past decade and and a little bit more than a decade is real estate, realtors used to be the gatekeepers for real estate. We had the keys, we knew the inside scoop. And now what's changed is Zillow and other sites like Trulia, realtor.com is they take that information and they put it in the hands of the consumers. So now it's all out publicly, publicly, most, most of the information, but 
But when you have a serious buyer, what they realize is, well, they've been looking at photography and evaluating different homes online. There's so much more to the process that they don't know. Um, and so once they get further into that, that home search or further into the transaction, they realize that there's, there's so much to do with contracts and strategy and pricing um, that they really need guidance. Well, I think I think also, Dana, you know, there's a way in which um, when we're when we're doing anything on the Internet for long periods of time, it starts to become a kind of astral projection. You know, it starts to become a kind of out of body experience. We're not really located uh, in our bodies and ourselves anymore. And we're seeing things that are virtual in nature. And and it's, I think, a, an experience that's somewhat distinct from actually encountering a house when you go and look at a house. You, you, know, you find out what the house smells like, what the noises are in the neighborhood. You find out that the person next door owns two emus. I, I mean, it, there's sort of a sense in which there, there's an artificiality to the Zillow experience as opposed to walking into a place. 100 percent. I, I think the, the bigger picture here is that real estate has become entertainment. Mm-hmm. So we see that on TV. Uh, HGTV, Selling Sunset, people are just hooked into these shows. We're on Instagram scrolling all day, seeing all these beautiful properties. We're on Zillow for more time than most of us care to admit. And it's this fantasy world, and it doesn't always translate to the actual process um, in real life, which is, if you're buying, a grind right now. It's very, very difficult to be a buyer. And I think sometimes people just prefer to to live in that virtual environment as opposed to actually being part of the reality. Yeah, it seems to me that, you know, one of the things that has happened is exactly what you just described, uh, which is that I think sort of in the late 70s and maybe going into the 80s, people started to think, um, started to diverge from the basic American idea that a house was a home, a house is the place that you were, you were going to live in. And a certain percentage of the public started to see a house as an investment, uh, started to see it as a house as a sort of thing that you would own and then maybe sell it and get a better one and get a better one or you'd flip it or, I mean, the flipping became a bigger and bigger thing. And now it's even more than that. It's it's not even about uh, using a house as, a, as an investment so much as it is a house a, as a dream. Uh, and, and I would imagine that that, you know, that comes with, with certain perils. Um, I, I guess I also wanted to ask both of you, but Ariel, I'll start with you. Um, the other thing that happened during the pandemic is that people found out that they don't necessarily have to be in a certain locale. That, you know, I mean, I live five minutes drive from the radio studio where I'm sitting right now from my place of work. I get mad if there's so much traffic that it takes me five minutes to get here. Uh, but the truth is for, I don't know, for about a year, a year, yeah, I sat in my house with enough radio equipment so it sounded like I was on the air. And I could, you know, theoretically, I could live a much greater distance from where I am right now. And that's even more true for certain other people. So I'm assuming, Ariel, one of the dreams that goes on in on Zillow isn't strictly a dream. It's the idea that, oh, yeah, you know what? I could probably live in Montana and show up at work once in a while. Absolutely. And I think we've seen a huge influx of people who are looking to do something similar. Maybe it's not Montana, but maybe it's something within a two hour drive of the city where they currently live. And I think we're, we might have people who are looking to see if they can live in Montana, because I think we're having this collective reimagining about what our lives would look like if it wasn't so oriented around work and going into the office. Right. And, you know, Dana, I'm sure you're seeing this, too. I mean, I even anecdotally know two kind of Boston-centered journalists who, because they really only have to be at work, I mean, their employers realize, we we'll really need to see your stupid face about twice a week. You know, that, that didn't mean they could move to Montana, but it did mean they could move to New Hampshire, right? I mean, there's now a way in which you don't have to stay in the state where you work. Correct. The pandemic definitely broke down geographic barriers for people. And there's been so much movement over the past 15 months as people realize that they no longer have the commuting restraints. There's a big difference between having to go into the office five days a week versus three days a week. So people are going for it. 
you know, they used to have to be in the city and now they're willing to commute three days a week and they're willing to buy a house on the north or south shore of Boston because they have that flexibility. I'm also wondering, you know, Ariel and I began talking about the notion of escape, escape from the place that you're actually in. And I'm also wondering whether you're noticing yet people seeking slightly different things. I mean, for example, you know, for a long time, the open floor plan has been a very desirable idea. But we've just been through a period where people maybe want to be able to close the door or get away from their kids for a few hours or use a particular room that's not a closet uh, as an office. Uh, I'm wondering if there's maybe a little bit, if tastes and and desires are shifting a little bit. And that's a question for, for Dana. So, yes, I would say to some extent, the main thing that people are craving is more space and more outdoor space. So for a few years, if if you can remember, it was all about uh, living small, micro lofts and small, small houses. And that I think has, has completely um, flipped. There's been an argument and I've seen a lot of headlines about people wanting the more closed off spaces. And, and frankly, I'm not seeing that. Um, most of my clients, they, they, they know, I mean, things are already getting back to normal and they want to entertain and the open kitchen living room space is a desirable uh, and workable flow. Um, but, but for sure, a home office is a must and it doesn't need to be huge, but that is something that has risen on the priority list for the majority of my clients. So, uh, Ariel, I'm wondering about you, too, because I should say that um, I live in a house that I love very much. It's not owned by me. It's owned by my partner, but uh, I I love the house. But I am a fairly enthusiastic cook, and the kitchen is so small that literally if the dog lies down on the floor in the middle of the kitchen while I'm cooking, which he likes to do so he can watch me, uh, I I mean, I have to do this kind of tarantella, just dance around him to get from the – the, the sink to the stove. There's kind of no room for anything. So the, if I'm on Zillow, one of the first things I do, I look at the kitchen and go, oh, that would be good. The dog and I would have room. You know, we wouldn't have to be in collision all the time. And, and you know, Ariel, you look at so many houses. Uh, I'm wondering if the things that you think you want are changing as a result. If you now think, oh, no, I would definitely want something like that. I think one of the things that's become really apparent to me since working at home for the past year has been how uh, dependent on natural light I am to feel kind of balanced and happy. And so natural light is obviously a thing that's really nice to have, but for me, it's become very obvious that it's a must. Um, And another big thing has been Realizing that proximity to friends is a really important thing. So as much as I love being out in the suburbs, um, I don't necessarily miss the city, but I do miss proximity with friends. And it's become this, this dream of mine where maybe my friends and I all buy houses next door to one another on the same street. And that's how we're able to have our separation, have our own spaces, but still be able to very easily see one another and, and be more integrated. Yeah, I mean, Dana, she makes a really interesting point, which is that I think for a lot of people for a long time in in American domestic life, the house was kind of where you went when you weren't at work or weren't out, you know, I don't know, going out to dinner or, you know, socializing. The house was kind of the the place that you went when you weren't doing certain things uh, that you either have to do or enjoy doing. And and for 15 months or so, the house was the place where you did everything. And I, I th- would imagine that not only yeah, do you look at the house and say, yeah, I want doors I can close or I want a bigger kitchen or, or whatever, but maybe you also really think very carefully about the house as – not this place where you just kind of sleep and get up and then go off and do things, but as this place that really is kind of a carapace around yourself and your life. Are people feeling a little bit differently in the, some of the ways that Ariel just suggested? So I think that people have a hard time articulating that because we are in this mode where we want to check off boxes. Does it meet my basic functionality? But what I have learned being in this field 
is that, well, at, at Sotheby's International Realty, we have a saying, and it's that your best life begins with a home that inspires you. And it is so true. People could have this checklist of we need this number of bedrooms, this number of baths, and then they go to a house and they have a feeling where they need that house. And somehow that house is going to make their lives better. And then the, the check boxes and the functionality seem to not be um, front and center. So yes, I think people are envisioning their values and how can a house help them to achieve whatever it is, wherever it is they're trying to get to. So um, the point that Ariel brought up is this um, dream for many people is living in close proximity to friends and family. So we've had more people buying multifamily homes where you have multiple apartments under one roof and maybe you have the in-laws in one unit and um, you're in the other unit or buy, trying to buy up multiple properties in a neighborhood or on a street because family is, is so important. The compound, the compound is yeah. coming back. All right, so we're going to have to take a break here. We're going to say a, a reluctant goodbye to Ariel Norling. Her newsletter is I Know a Spot. You should get involved with I Know a Spot. Uh, Dana will be back because we have to deal with one last little thorny issue. Are you required to tell the buyer if you're selling a house that has poltergeists? We are back. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, it's good to be back in the studio. Good to be back with Kat Pastor, our technical producer. Today's show, as I have pointed out before, is produced by celebrity producer Lily Tyson, who is uh, available to us uh, this summer, and we are taking full advantage of that availability. Um, so we are, we've are we been talking about dreaming on Zillow, but what about nightmares? Um, in fact, uh, there are, there is a whole category. I should say, I uh, should reintroduce with us, and now is Dana Bull, a, reator, a realtor with Sagan Harborside Sotheby's International Realty based in Massachusetts, a former columnist for the Zillow Group. So, Dana, there's a whole property and a whole term um, uh, within real estate called stigmatized properties. Explain what stigmatized properties are. So a stigmatized property is something that would elicit some sort of psychological or emotional response um, on part of the buyer negatively. So this could be a suicide, a murder, um, cult activity, other types of misfortunes or crimes. And haunted houses falls into that umbrella terminology. Although it's it's murky. I mean, I think there are only four states where you are absolutely required to uh, disclose. Maybe even you have to be asked whether a house is haunted. Because, I mean, it would, you know, there's, it's one thing to say, well, you know, there was a, a murder in this house because that's sort of provable and ascertainable. But, I mean, a, the idea that a house, house is haunted is kind of a matter of opinion, isn't it? I absolutely agree. So there's definitely a lot of gray area here. And, and, I mean, we should also say that there are people who might want a house to be haunted either because they're that kind of person, they're into the paranormal, or they might want a house to be haunted or for people to think a house is haunted because the house will be less expensive, they'll be able to kind of bottom feed on it? Yeah, it's rare, but it happens. I should mention that I one of the areas where I practice real estate is in Salem, Massachusetts, so Salem has the history, the witch trials, and just sort of spooky happenings are, um, it's a big thing in Salem, and where the housing inventory is so old that it's something that comes up more often than in other, other communities that I serve. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would, have, I would think that somebody who's buying a house in Salem, Massachusetts, I mean, most people would probably be somewhat aware of the reputation. So they probably are going to ask, right? Or, or I mean, not every single buyer you deal with, but there's going to be buyers who are going to say, well, does this whole thing have any witch or witch trial connection? How do you handle that? 
So the way that it works is it's all about disclosures and each state handles it differently. So for instance, in Massachusetts, we're, we're pretty lax in terms of disclosures and, you know, ethically, if you know of some activity, you, you should disclose that. However, does the law obligate you to do that? No. Right. However, yeah. um, if a buyer asks specifically, and I'm listing a property and I know the owners have mentioned something, then I am going to pass that information on to the buyers. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it, it does seem like it's also a murky enough area where perception is reality in some cases. So let's imagine that I unknowingly buy a house that, you know, really has sort of an Amity level Rep, rep, Amityville rep, reputation, uh, and and I, I might find it difficult for me to resell. In other words, it might not be as good an investment uh, as I thought, even if I don't believe, and and no rational person believes that that there's demonic activity or paranormal activity in the house. It still could conceivably be a problem when I want to turn the house over myself. Right, I would say it's it's so rare that this situation crops up. Um, interestingly, I work on a team and at one point we, we actually had a client who that was a benefit because again, this was in Salem mm-hmm. and there was a property that was, people had mentioned, it was, it was known and had a reputation for, for having some paranormal activity. And that is actually, that, that became a selling point. But again, I think that's in relation to to the area where we were, which was Salem, Massachusetts. It's probably actually harder to sell a house uh, where an actual murder committed. And from what I could tell, looking at, at case law and, and state by state law, there's uh, a little bit more uh, of a burden, in, at least in some states, if there's been a murder within the last three years or something like that. You, you know, either are required to disclose or at least required to disclose if asked. Yes. And uh, that... Well, as you mentioned earlier, that isn't up for debate. That's an event that happened. Um, whereas with haunted houses, a lot of people don't believe in any of it. So is it even a conversation that needs to be had, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are there? Are you aware of instances where somebody who wanted to buy a house sort of kind of ginned up the rumor a little bit more that it was haunted, hoping to drive people away? I actually, I haven't. I come across that situation. It would be an interesting buyer, uh, unusual buyer strategy anyway, to try, yeah. to, try to convince the rest of the world uh, that, yeah. the, that the house is haunted. So, um, you know, we only got about, about 30 seconds uh, or 40 seconds left here. I don't know, as, as we leave this whole topic, uh, how is, has your job changed dramatically in, in this kind of modern, almost post-pandemic era? So I think with re- everybody just was obsessed with real estate this year. It, it's all anyone's been talking about and focusing on because we've been stuck in our houses. So, um, you know, honestly, I'm just, I'm excited to get back to normal, going out and doing open houses and seeing people in person again. And real estate's supposed to be fun. And this year it was just a lot of, it was challenging. Yeah. Um, so, Yeah. Desperation is not never fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Dana Bull, thank you so much for joining us uh, from Sagan Harborside Sotheby's International Realty based in Massachusetts, where you can now live if you work in Connecticut and only have to show up two days a week. Uh, you can live <laughs> a lot of places. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks to Lily. Thanks to Kat. Thanks to everybody for listening. We'll be back. I can't say what's tomorrow because I don't even know what tomorrow is. I mean, for you, I don't know what tomorrow is.